the legacy and the history. <laughs> and I was trying to think about the legacy and the history of those relationships in terms of what was there, who was going. It was kind of in some ways uh, partially sparked and informed by my own experience um, living and studying in China as an African-American woman. And so when I began to look into the history, one of the first figures I came across was actually Du Bois and his writings on uh, China and Africa and reading about his speech uh, that he gave on his 91st birthday and also some of his other writings about uh, the new China and his kind of conversations that he was having and his trips to China, finding news report, news uh, recordings in both uh, U.S. and in the China press. And so for me, that was kind of interesting to think about. This was, I knew about Du Bois. I had read The Souls of Black Folks and studied his work, never knew about his time in China. And I was like, where is his other history? What, you know, why does not mean so much discussed? And it got me further exploration into other individuals who are in some ways in that kind of same time period and cohort. So kind of think about what does it mean to add this other dimension, this other identity perspective into these conversations. And so what began is what I used to call because I know Black Relations is where I moved from the African American experience in Maoist China, which is my previous research, to looking more into the contemporary understandings of the Black diaspora and their engagement with China. So as China is growing, what are these moments of engagement, whether in China um, or whether in some ways in other countries where China has a heavy interest or engagement? What is happening when we have those moments of contact, um, whether it can be a political, economic, but I'm more interested particularly in the social, cultural, thinking about the people to people, what happens in these ideas or how these social cultural ideas are in some ways informing and shaping different policies. Um, if you ever know anyone who, um, the, one of the, the great things that we had a, a recent event between uh, the Black China Caucus and Nabia, and it was talking about, uh, you know, living while Black in China, and it was from people who were, you know, there as students or who there was working, and they're kind of in some ways explaining how their experiences in some ways are a little different, and how in some ways that leads to differences in terms of the conversations or the perspectives that are added to what's happening, and how this in some ways also can apply to how they're sometimes being treated, um, even though they are official representatives of the United States government, which also makes you think about when we think about ideas of what I call networks of difference. How does that um, in some ways come into contact with China as it's going to, is expanding its outreach through initials like the Belt and Road or the kind of South-South cooperation? What does it mean when they're engaging with African nations or nations in the Caribbean where the majority of populace is people who identify as Black or part of Black diaspora or also places in um, who have uh, their leadership also reflects that as well. And so it has me thinking about those kind of conversations. Does race play a part of it? And so in the Western context, we call it thinking about race. Uh, ideas of race and, and racism, and it comes down to um, more largely identity formation. How is identity form? What are the structures that form it? What are the processes that are somewhere in different societies that lead to identity? And how does that lead to um, other ways of thinking about the world and navigating with the world itself? And so I use the term uh, networks of difference as I talk about China specifically, because using the term race and racism um, in some cases is a loaded term. Uh, one is met with in some ways uh, uh, kind of um, it's, it's not necessarily rejected, but it's met with a, some uh, kind of a re re reaction to it. We hear the word race or racism, it elicits a response. But in China, the response is a little bit different. Um, one of the, the two main arguments I always hear, one is that uh, we don't have races, our ACES, therefore we're not racist. We have Xiao Shu which is important because that is how they identify the nation state and peoplehood. So it is important. So it's not just the area of semantics, it is in terms of thinking about nationalism and how that is important, how they identify as a nation and people identity. And so for them to say that is very much about we, how can we be racist if we don't have necessarily the same categories. But also there's another uh, conversation when it comes to the black other particularly, is the idea we don't have the same uh, legacies as Western nations do when it comes to uh, China slavery, that the system of the transatlantic slave trade, where we don't have that same legacy in history, therefore we're not racist to uh, the Black other. But also what happens in those conversations, while those are the reasons why they reject those terms, there is still difference being made, and there's difference with distinction, and how that plays out in terms of the ways in which identity formation is structured in China through um, ideas such as blood, kinship and other networks that are very much part of these conversations. And so I think uh, I use the term networks of difference to one, be respectful of the arguments that come from uh, Chinese scholars and come from people in China to relate to these conversations, but two, not to do, uh, to impose, uh, you know, Western ideas and terms onto a different space as well, trying to be in some ways thinking through to get across the conversation, to have more conversation about, you might not call it this, but think about how these particular um, engagements follow, uh, come, come together. Think about moments of you have, um, 
where you have backlash and it's against our good people. What does that mean in that space? And so I think we're talking about these terms that kind of helps me think through and kind of engage and expands my conversation a bit more. Think about the ways in which difference happens. Also use the term anti-blackness as well, using that framework because that is a, a global, uh, unfortunately it is global. And so global anti-blackness also allows me to talk more particularly about the ways in which black bodies and black people are treated or how the ways in which blackness is understood or some ways not always are understood or always able to act access certain things in certain spaces. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. I've been trying to more recently think about and connect it to the kind of growing uh, Chinese presence that I mentioned before in these different spaces and thinking about what does this mean in terms of engagement, thinking through uh, kind of soft diplomacy initiatives. Uh, we think about some of these other uh, cases as well. What does it mean um, when you have these ideas and networks and how are these understandings happening and how do people respond to them? And as it want to change as we have more engagement, or are we going to some way see some of the same kind of uh, tropes over and over that can be seen as problematic and difficult for uh, these particular relationships? And I was relationships start to change uh, as we see different nations are starting to um, in some ways you know how they're uh, shifting in terms of their perspective or their engagement with China what does that mean in terms of people to people diplomacy peoplehood and also thinking through those conversations as well so that's why I am kind of putting together some new ideas trying to piece the past and the present in some interesting ways and thinking about um, as, as more conversations thinking about kind of global racial politics and what does that mean in relation to kind of historical and cultural understandings of what I call sino black relations so uh, that's me I hope it wasn't too much of a repeat for those who all who I had a chance to speak to last semester. Um, I do want to open the conversation to any questions you all may have about this topic more broadly or more generally, however you want to go. So with that being said, I'm happy to, to answer any questions or get the conversation going. You can also ask questions of each other. Don't feel you have to ask me. I'm happy to answer questions, but I hope we get a dialogue going as well. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And like Dr. Brown said, um, we'll open the floor to questions and conversations. Feel free to respond to each other. Um, and I think we have a lot to unpack, so let's get started. Does anyone want to kick us off? All right, if not, um, something that I'm sort of curious to learn more about, uh, we've talked a lot in EPIC this year about Chinese nationalism um, and how to some extent the Chinese identity and Chinese nationalism has, uh, relates to this notion of joining together against Western imperialism um, and anti-Asian racism. And then as you were sort of talking about, there's this idea in China that China doesn't have a race problem. Um, and so I'm sort of curious to know what the relationship that you see is between uh, Chinese nationalism and race or networks of difference. I really appreciate that term and I'll try to start using it. Um, and yeah, specifically nationalism and anti-Black racism too, if you can touch on that. I know that's a very big question, but. <laughs> Thank you, that is a big question. But um, one of the frameworks, um, there's a variety of, of nationalism, how we can think about nationalism as this, this big term. Um, and think about Benedict Anderson's kind of discussion of this kind of imagined community, right? But there's also different forms, different uh, facets of nationalism. And the one that I look um, very close at is ethno-nationalism, where this idea of you have an uh, ethnic identity or, or kind of this kind of identity that's part of the nationalist narrative. So we think about China, um, particularly think about the idea that you have the 56 uh, uh, ethnic nationalities. That's very much kind of an example, this kind of idea of where this is part of the nation state. When you have China on kind of the global stage, think about, say, the 2008 Olympics, that was part of the opening ceremony to show this is who we are as China and these are who are our people. And so ethno-nationalism brings in these concepts of peoplehood, um, identity, and ethnic on the lines of ethnicity as well. And so for me, that's kind of a, a good launching pad to um, think about this particular form of nationalism that we kind of see are emerging uh, that's not unique to the PRC. There's something that kind of in some ways we can think about uh, looking at, say, modern Chinese history, look at the Qing as kind of one of those first kind of early examples of the idea of thinking about ethno-nationalism. What does it mean to bring in all these different people to keep them under one particular nation or uh, kind of one particular governmental umbrella? And so thinking about this idea of ethno-nationalism, it in some ways um, allows the Chinese nation state to in some ways engage in these conversations about identity along the lines of peoplehood, but also allows them to think about in, in conjunction with other forms of nationalism, thinking about um, how they want to swarm themselves in terms of the nation state and other frameworks and engage in conversations about anti-US imperialism, anti-Western imperialism, be able to um, in some ways critique it through the lens of a uh, identity conversation where we see if we look at some of the writings from the PRC under the Maoist era, 
um, they're in some ways challenging Western imperialism, not just because of its policies, but also because of its treatment of people. So engaging this idea of looking at peoplehood, identity, and being that another lens of critique, how we can critique race in the U.S. as a means of kind of engaging in these conversations, thinking about the Black American experience as a means of critiquing it. So they can use the idea of ethnonationalism as a framework or a lens to also engage and think about peoplehood in other spaces as, as well. Um, I'm thinking about more contemporary in terms of, uh, and as we I have fortunately seen with the horrible, the horrible and deplorable shooting of of eight people um, in Atlanta, which uh, it just broke my heart to to really see that. Um, and it was, you know, I, when I taught on Thursday, on Thursday, on class on Wednesday, I was like, we're not going to have class as usual. We need to, we're doing Chinese history. We need to talk about this because this is this is horrible. Um, but just thinking about how this is another conversation that I hope both sides will engage in because they are, I think in the recent talks, you know, the idea of um, uh, you know, kind of the conversational rhetoric about Black Lives Matter was brought up and China was like, well, you do this to Black people. And then it's like all these conversations about race are happening now in this conversation. So I'm hoping that um, they're starting to use or think about questions about um, uh, kind of discrimination, whether it is anti-Asian or anti-Black or whatever the case may be, how to have more uh, conversations leading to how do we think about this systematically, think about these forms of uh, the ways in which these structures are formed, where this, events like this happen are able to happen and have conversations more about how can we uh, in some ways have conversations but not just be using it as a means to be a tactical or kind of deploy it as a means of uh, throwing some kind of um, critique or attack back at each other and I think for me that's been the case for much of the discussion prior to this but I'm hoping that unfortunately because of the horrible uh, rise of crimes against anti uh, a, the, the Asian community kind of the spike uh, it's been like over what 100 percent like increase it's just it's, it's no it's just absolutely just deplorable and those are the cases that we know about um, which is sad to say there are probably other cases we don't know about but how this might need to be a real conversation when thinking about nationalism and peoplehood and what does that mean um, for thinking about the Asia uh, diaspora more broadly especially thinking about how a lot of that um, rhetoric comes from and thinking about the, the pandemic itself how about your question I think I went around the world I don't know if <laughs> No, that, that made a lot of sense. And I appreciate you bringing up the point about the rise in anti-Asian hate that we've seen in this country. I think that's a really important conversation and something that we sort of touched on really briefly, actually, on the keynote address um, at the start of the symposium. So mm -hmm. good full circle conversation there. Does anyone have anything they want to chime in with? I was curious. Um... In the U.S., there's this this debate over whether ethnic identity and race or simply class are responsible for a lot of the disparities that we see in the American population. Um, and I'm wondering, like, how that plays out in China, um, if there is just a really strong correlation between those things, especially as it relates to Black identity in China, or um, if it is clearly one or the other that creates disparities um, just in lifestyles and conditions and income. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great question. I think another element to add is thinking about um, uh, uh, an identity, think about national identity, where one is coming from, because we think about in um, the in China, you know, if you want to come and if you're going, say, you instance, uh, we have a variety of people who come into China for different reasons. Some are coming to go to school, some go for education. Um, so they're in school, that's a different demographic there, right? You go to school and what that means. So I'm coming to work and you want to open businesses, but in some cases it might be difficult to open a business or to have longevity um, because in many cases you're not uh, necessarily a, a full citizen. And so in many cases also the idea of national uh, identity, where you are from, and if you're able to be able to find means of longevity to get support uh, from the Chinese government to be able to keep your business. And so sometimes just with those who own businesses that we see a lot of upheaval and turnover um, in terms of what they're able to do and as a result of their, their visa status and what it needs to in terms of renewing that as well. So I think some of it might be um, questions about, um, you know, uh, 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 identity in terms of maybe our own, own ideas of, of race, but a lot of it also has to do with, uh, with national identity, who can come from where and whether the Chinese law is allowing uh, foreigners to be able to do certain things with property or be able to have, you know, register for, you know, how do you register for your household? And what does that mean if you want to stay long term? Or, you know, what happens in those spaces, having to, uh, you know, negotiate that in terms of where you want to be, but also where you're from and what does that mean? So I know some uh, individuals, they get, uh, I know we had a chance, we were in Hong Kong, uh, we met someone who had worked there. He started an NGO, but he got funding from a uh, US, uh, kind of a US uh, institution. 
um, because uh, the Chinese government does not really give uh, NGO funds to someone who's not Chinese or the money's not going to directly to the Chinese population. So you want to do an NGO like a, a nonprofit or something to find external funds, which can also lead to other problems in terms of do they allow, you know, what countries allow what spaces to get what kind of funding and what they have is that funding dries up. And so trying to be creative with trying to find support. So sometimes it also comes down to um, the type of, you know, comes down to, to national identity sometimes too. Even though doing more engagement, there's still not in some ways a parallel between who can do what. And uh, there's not necessarily always the same open access to, to foreigners in China in terms of being able to have longevity and protection. And so what does that mean for people? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I kind of had a follow-up question to that. Uh, do you think there's like a conception in China that in order to be considered fully Chinese, you need to be like Han Chinese by blood? Or, you know, is there... Yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak more about like what their con conception is of, of, of Chinese. Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, so the Han Chinese, that's the overall majority that we know of. Um, and we can know that they're the majority out of the 56. But if you ever get a chance to um, read uh, Thomas Mulaney's book about counting the 56, he talks about the whole process that happened in about 1954, 1955. Where the, where the 56 come from, right? The 56 were not always there. But in our lifetime, that's what we know of because we came after that was already created. But he talks about the process and the creation of 56 in terms of it was actually more identities, but how they created these different groups in different places. And so I think in many cases, um, the idea of even like the Han majority, you have these 56 ethnic minorities. I think that also counts as, as being Chinese. Um, I think in many cases, it's kind of really, um, I'm thinking of kind of the, the legal way of thinking about it and also thinking about the ways in which it has been traditionally thought about in terms of thinking about blood and linkages. You know, if you have Chinese blood, that makes you in some ways Chinese. But thinking about American citizenship, it's about where you're born, right? You're born on American soil. You know, what happens in those cases? So you are American in some ways based upon geography more so than in some ways lineage. And so in many cases in China, it's more about some ways lineage. So I remember I had a chance to, when I was 16, don't ask me how, because it's still, when I look back, I'm like, that was a weird experience. I actually was part of a root seeking summer camp and those are people who are Chinese descent to go back to China and I was a I was a special guest I don't I don't know how my Chinese teacher did it but I remember it was interesting having those conversations with students who were Asian American born and raised in the U.S. they were second generation Asian American but they were like you know we go back to China we're so you know we're seen as Chinese because our parents our, our lineage our family is from China we have Chinese blood and so there was like it's not about necessarily where you're born but it's about the, the kind of the blood conversation you know, the idea about lineage and linking and thinking about um, having that kind of um, connection to um, uh, previous generations to your ancestors. So I think more so it's not just about the Han in terms of what makes uh, Chinese identity. I think it's more about thinking about the Chinese as a larger collective, about the Chinese diaspora, what that means as well. Um, I do think in China today, uh, since the Han is a majority, like any times we have a majority and minority, uh, the majority is the one who uh, some way sets the norms and the standards and certain things and, and kind of the, in, in the society. So in some ways it's useful to be able to assimilate or to be, you know, kind of more uh, closely aligned with the majority, but I don't necessarily think that means you're uh, any less Chinese if you're seen as, say, uh, another ethnic identity. So I think it's a, it's a if I do can come to like think about the Chinese diaspora more broadly, how that makes uh, interesting conversation for thinking about identity. I think for me that also brings up a point where I'm thinking about and working through conversations about uh, mixed race and biracial children who are born with Chinese and uh, black ancestry, whether it's uh, black American, black Caribbean, or uh, of someone who's from the continent, Africa. And what does that mean moving forward if they are of Chinese blood, what does that mean for them in terms of nationalism and identity? Would they be able to claim being Chinese or not? Because there are more of those families and more children being born who are more biracial, multiracial. And so thinking through those questions about uh, nationalism and citizenship and would they be able to access that? Yeah, hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, that, that was really helpful. Um, thank you. Other questions? <laughs> sort of sort of going off of that. Um, I'm curious, what's interesting to me, and I'm remembering, kind of remembering some of what you were talking about in the fall with Mao. Um, it's really clear to me, at least, that like Mao had this idea of global colored solidarity against imperialism, um, and U.S. imperialism, but imperialism more broadly. And there's sort of this, like, as China has become more powerful, I think we've seen what they've done um, against specific minorities within their country in Tibet and Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Um, and there's, I think, a very obvious uh, juxtaposition there in 
difference in those two ideas there. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little more, um, a little more to that and what, how, how you're viewing what's, what's happening in those regions against those specific minorities on the topic of minorities. Yeah. Um, so I think with the, what's happening in, you, know, you have like the, you know, the way in which the state was, um, so we clamped down on the protesters in Hong Kong and um, what's happening in Tibet and also in Xinjiang with the, uh, the, the uh, I mean, for better, I mean, for lack of uh, better words, the concentration camps that are happening there, um, there is a way in which there are uh, finding ways to, whenever you are able to, as a state, to find ways to, uh, in some ways, repress or in some ways, uh, go against a segment of the population. In some ways, you're able to, um, in some ways, dehumanize them or make them seen as they're the outside or the extreme. And that's what we see in those cases where this idea of them pushing back against the more, um, if we can kind of look back at the, the rise of Xi Jinping and kind of see the ways in which initial kind of economic changes, we also see in many cases, um, uh, a, a clamping down on civil society where we see changes to where it's not in some ways as uh, open as it used to be. There's a crackdown on civil society that's happening very concentrated. And there's new identity of this idea of this kind of, uh, I hate to go back to the term that Mao uses new China, but there is kind of an idea of this kind of global China now, this kind of way in China is reshaping its identity on the global stage in lieu of its um, new initiatives. How is it is happening where there are in some ways finding ways to say, this is who is, part of the populace, and this is how we can find ways to say how we're redefining China, and how they're in some ways using it to also say, um, this is also, we want you to become more close to social with this new China that we're forging, and if you're not in some ways part of that project, then we're going to have to reshape and refashion you to be part of that. So we're thinking about it in terms of Xinjiang, it's along the lines of racial, as along the line of religious and ethnic identity. Um, we're thinking about Tibet along the same thing, religious and, and, and kind of identity as well. And in the Hong Kong, it's along the lines of kind of uh, political and local identity, where we think about the protests, unfortunately, the way it was very much talked about in the U.S. press was, oh, it's these people in Hong Kong who should be happy that they have all these laws and protections and rule law, should be happy what was going on, and it's just one little thing that's happening, why they're making such a big fuss over it. And so I think in many cases, it, um, the narratives overlooked, like we can also imagine places like Xinjiang and Tibet, it's a more complicated, multi-layered narrative where it was about local politics, about having the right to in some ways think about the promises that were made to keep those promises to the people of Hong Kong about the 40 year period between when uh, they were going to the 40 year moment, had this 40 year period, but to be able to have that space to kind of grow and exchange, we can able to keep the rule of law, to keep policies in place, to still have uh, democratic elections, to not have to be extradited to mainland China, which they did not feel as a safe practice if you were arrested. And how we see in many cases, that happens in a way. And so this idea of like, when they're not necessarily conforming to this face of this new China one put out there, how certain groups are some ways are in some ways stigmatized and how they're in some ways talked about in ways to say, this is why we justify what we're doing and how they can do that in the nation state where you think about it. And we have been in other places too. It's not just uh, China, not the only one, uh, but we're talking about China today more specifically, but how they're able to say, this is the image we're crafting and how they can justify on the one hand, we're talking about close out the area, we're talking about button roll, we're talking about building infrastructure, we're talking about all this cooperation, we're giving money to these places and it sounds good. On the other hand, how they're also some ways uh, uh, horribly treating people who are who are Chinese or treating their own citizens and how they're justifying and putting those hairs to say, this is why we can do this and this is why it makes it okay. And how we're trying to someone show this idea of what this new China is. Um, as I mentioned, I had a chance to be in Hong Kong um, last January, which is crazy to think those were my last trips. And I was like, I did not know that two months later, the world was going to completely <laughs> be shut down for a while. But I remember just being able to go to, um, the, the square where they're having much of the protests. I remember we took a trip there and that day we were there was, was a much smaller protest. It was not one of the larger ones, but just being there, you can just feel just the energy. You can just feel the, the frustration. You can feel the pain. Like people were really, it was like, it was very deeply emotional space. And because it was something that people were really fighting for, trying to in some ways have a, a Hong Kong that they knew of, but also try to keep Hong Kong striving and strong and be able to say, well, these are the promises that we were given you know, are you going to honor those or are you going to come in and, and not do so? And so to go through Hong Kong and see um, and feel that we see armed police on the corners, it was like, this is, this is different. This is not the Hong Kong I remember. And having those moments of where uh, a few of us, we did, uh, you know, cry because we're like, it, it, you can feel it. And I remember they were calling out to other people. And I remember kind of bringing back to the idea of global solidarity. The Hong Kong protests, we saw flags from all over the world. They had flags, you know, asking and kind of appealing to different people around the world and thinking about global culture there most particularly. This was in January and it was right before King got the King's birthday. And there was a speech where somebody gave and a young guy, you could tell he was in Mandarin. He said, I have a dream. He was invoking King also the idea of a dream, but also invoking 
the, the language of the Chinese nation state of this idea of the China dream and kind of using that language on two different fronts. So saying I have a dream very clearly, um, it was kind of evoking King, but also a play on the China uh, ideal of this China dream. What does that mean for Hong Kong? What do we fit into this China dream? And so that protest kind of brought it back to the idea of like trying to reach out to the uh, community, global community, and trying to support each other and think about how do we keep uh, fighting for those who are fighting for just causes. I think I'd be out there. I talk too long, so I guess I'd be rambling. <laughs> you give a faster microphone, we can't help it. <laughs> um, I'm sort of curious to extend, expand on that point a little more because um, I know there was a pretty big connection between the civil rights movement and the Mao era. And so it's really interesting to hear civil rights figures uh, being invoked in Hong Kong. So I would love to hear hear you explore that a little more and also um, learn a little more historically about uh, those figures in the Mao era as well. Yeah, so uh, I remember, so while Dr. King never went to, to China, he never was in that space, um, a lot of uh, what Mao was doing in terms of his speeches or in terms of the release date of his speeches was centered around Dr. King. So uh, the speech supported African Americans 1963, that was on the eve of the March of Washington. The one that came out in April 1968, that was after King was assassinated. So his, uh, you know, his timing of his speeches was very much tied to what was happening as well. He also in those speeches kind of really invokes um, different moments in the civil rights movement. So it talks about like the Little Rock Nine and those things and some of his speeches where in some ways he's aware of and has no knowledge and the news about um, what's happening in terms of civil rights movement. Um, I think for him, for Mao, I think getting someone like Du Bois who was connected to uh, the long uh, civil rights movements, not just uh, the one of the 1950s and 60s, but kind of thinking through uh, the long 20th century civil rights movement where you have people like uh, Du Bois who's writing about in the turn of 20th century, the problem of the, the 20th century, the problem of the color line, which unfortunately we see in the 21st century still the same problem right? The problem with the 20th century is the problem with line. He's writing souls of black folks. He's talking about double consciousness. He's really trying to put pen to paper and put uh, in some ways uh, tangible uh, words to what the black experience was, they might have psychologically and emotionally. And so for him who has so much um, again, clout and so much um, kind of connections in both the U.S. and also in different countries in, in Africa, because by this point he was living in Ghana after he went on uh, self-imposed exile, after his experience with uh, McCarthy and being called in front of the, the House of Un-American Committees, uh, Un-American Committees, uh, he was like, I'm not dealing with this anymore. Um, but how in some ways he was still very much part of those conversations because he was original founder of the NAACP, the National Association of Color, Advancement of Color, National Association for the Advancement of Color People. And it also had people like, um, who are people who are connected to the civil rights, but through more so through labor activism. So we think about people like Vicki Garvin, who goes, she was very much about grassroots organizing labor rights in New York, looking at that as a place of how do we have, uh, think about civil rights movement, not just in terms of the right to vote, but also you know, the ability to have the, uh, express our rights to vote, but also thinking about uh, equality in terms of pay, in terms of labor, in terms of organizing. How do we find ways to where this is also a civil rights issue? Um, other women who are going as well, think about Robert F. Williams, who's very much kind of seen as this connection between civil rights movement and then the Black Power movement, where his writings about um, the Negroes with guns, he's talking about, you know, armed uh, self-resistance, where, you know, the idea that as American citizens, we have the right to have guns as well, including Black Americans, what does that mean? Now he's just kind of this linchpin between those uh, two organizations, even though he's not uh, in the U.S. at the time that we see all these movements happening, he's in China. And so having them being able to, to be in China to have we see Mao very much um, talking about Robert Williams and invoking him in his speeches as well, kind of shows that there is, there was a connection, there were understanding and using the kind of global uh, outreach kind of one be connected to African Americans, but also think about civil rights movement use television as well. They see, you look at the ways where they were using uh, this new medium to show what was happening. Like, we're not just going to talk about it. I'm going to show you that they're firing, you know, putting, uh, they're putting water hoses on us, using water cannons. They're using dogs. Have you ever seen a water cannon? Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Birmingham and go to, they have a park that's across from the uh, Civil Rights Museum there and actually have a stone uh, replica of, of a water cannon. And those things were not like just a water, like a fire hose. They were like a cannon that shot out water so much more powerfully. So your position is, they're talking about the Children's March in Birmingham. So using this on this huge, like powerful water on 75 pound children who are marching because they want to have rights as children to be able to have, um, you know, you know, if we're going to have separate equal, can we get equal? Can we have better schools? Can we have better rights? Can we have better spaces? So uh, I think there was a lot of connection 
And we're thinking about it, engaging these conversations through on um, the question of, uh, you know, kind of anti use imperialism, but also thinking about the ways in which race as America's Achilles heel and kind of using this experience or thinking about African American experience to also say this is also why uh, it might not be the best to align with the U.S. because you are a nation like, you know, for instance, that gun on the crew. Why would you align with a nation who does this to its people and people who look like you? And you have a lot of scholars who write about this as well, who talk about when uh, African diplomats come to the U.S. and they travel by car. Once they land somewhere in the U.S., they travel up to D.C. and how they're like, oh, to New York to go to the U.N. They're like, wait, I couldn't eat with my other diplomats. I had to sit outside in the back or I was pulled over. I couldn't go to the hotel. And so this question about, you know, there was a lot of issues with the U.S. in terms of its policy and how the civil rights movement was very much connected to what Mal was talking about and how he was connected to people as well as the events and the moments as well. Go for it. Oh, yes. Hi, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much for taking the time out to, to speak. And this is a really fascinating topic. Um, I actually took a really uh, wonderful African American course at Tufts. Um, um, Professor uh, Gerald Gill, I don't know if you um, yeah, yeah, yeah. heard of him. Yeah, he was amazing, an amazing lecturer. And so, um, so I did study a little bit about W. Du Bois. And um, what I find fascinating, I would like your thoughts on this, because he definitely said, you know, he. He was persecuted because of McCarthyism in the United States, and so that's a form of repression. Yeah. Uh, but he passed away in 1963, and mm -hmm. in 1966, Mao started the Cultural Revolution, which which lasted about a decade, yeah. and that was yeah. a severe sociopolitical, you know, repression. And so one could argue that this type of you know cultural revolution is you can see kind of microforms, microcosms of that right now, relatively. Um, in, you know, uh, with the Uyghur, Uyghurs and also with Tibetan um, uh, Buddhists and also Tibetans and also even Falun Gong, you know, practitioners, especially with the crackdown on Tiananmen Square. So what would, what are your thoughts? What would you, um, what are your thoughts about what W. Du Bois would have thought about this? You know, how would he have felt had he lived to see that happen? Oh, wow. That's another question. <laughs> <laughs> he lived a full life though. He lived, he died when he was 90. I mean, he died when he was in his 90s. So he had a full, a full life to say yeah. the least. Uh, not just least at all. Um, but I think that is, is a good conversation and a good question because I know that he was not around during um, the culture revolution, but you do have others who I research who were there and they didn't talk about it because the idea is like, you know, as many, you know, nation states do this, the idea of statecraft and what the message is getting out. And so the idea of what the culture revolution was or how it was like, you know, it the language was like, it's, you know, using culture as a means to revitalize and re, you know, change the nation state. And so that was the rhetoric that was going out, but that's not what actually was happening, as you mentioned, because you know, like, it was not that at all. Uh, let's be real, if I lived in the culture revolution, I'd probably be paraded down the street somewhere, because I'm in a position of like, no, you represent the four O's, right? Um, and or you represent bourgeois culture, you know, a college professor, like, I couldn't be, it would not have been one who would have been safe in that space. But I think, um, like Robert Williams was there, Vicki Garvin was there. She actually was teaching in Shanghai and she actually leave Shanghai and moved to Beijing because schools got shut down. And so she actually changed a whole career as a result of it. So they were there as part of, in uh, China in the midst of it. Not sure how much they saw or witnessed because they were, uh, I know in the case of Robert Williams, a special guest. I do know that he did see his son's teachers being paraded down the street. Um, he did mention that in interviews much later in life once he was uh, back in the U.S. He did mention that he saw that, but he never wrote about it in his newsletter for Saturday that was still getting circulation while in the U.S. So there was a lot happening. But in terms of this idea of repression, uh, I think it is happening. I think it's happening on a, a very um, a grand scale. We have whole regions, a whole people uh, who are all, you know, in some ways being uh, told that their way of life is in some ways um, is, is not, they're not able to, to live and to function and to be able to, um, you know, have the basic human rights of just being able to, of uh, freedom, all right? And so this idea of not being able to be who you are. And so I think this idea of repression, I think Du Bois would have, um, he did change his opinions a lot because at first in the 30s went to China, he was like, oh, I'm for, I'm pro-Japan because Japan is doing the right thing with this whole co-prosperity sphere. And then he later had to apologize, like, yeah, I was wrong about that. Um, I do think that if he was able to witness, so this kind of gets into like revisionist history, so a little bit, so mm -hmm. uh, no, don't, 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 don't quote me. Um, but I will say that I think he would not have been for any form of repression, any form, shape, or form. I do think that, um, because of his own experiences in the U.S., his own experiences being a, a black man um, in a global space tour, even though he had um, a prestige, had a name, and he had a, a power, and he had a legacy 
I mean, he was a prolific writer. You can find, he wrote about almost every topic you think of. He has so many books, um, so many essays, so many writings. I think in any form of repression is something that he was very much against. And he was very much about, he was pro-Afro in solidarity. He was very clear about that. He also was very much about uh, people being able to, what solidarity means across the board, meaning everyone in those, those spaces being able to be part of the conversation, um, where you're not in some way silencing some groups in the form of, in some ways, uplifting the whole group. So saying that we're doing this whole uplift by, in some ways, silencing mm -hmm. certain voices who are not able to be part of this kind of chorus of, of thinking about solidarity. And we can kind of see this in some of his writings, and one of which is his um, non uh, fiction uh, his fictional story about um dark princess where his protagonist um, has this kind of experience where he's a, a black american he leaves and goes overseas because he was because of race and racism he's forced out of medical school and uh and that actually was a real thing where you can have documents that show that a lot of african americans will apply to, to med school and like well we don't know if we can train you. We don't know if we, we have a space here. We don't know. I mean, they, it happened over and over, unfortunately, um, to many black doctors who they were, uh, they were able to go, but they were not able to get resources. And it happened over and over on the side tangent. Um, but the protagonist um, goes to France. He's at this kind of dinner table, and it's like people from around the world who represent Afro Asia. And he remembers seeing the way in which he's like, you know, his character felt in some ways kind of silenced, where Matthew Towns, the, the character's name, was someone's like, you know, they want us to be here, but the African American experience is some ways not always seen as like, can you give us to the table? And so I think we can look at his writings and other writings like that to see that he would have been against a form of repression idea that we're going to have solidarity and movements bring everyone to the table. Um, I do think that some of his writings about uh, race are more um, uh, more progressive than his writings about gender. He's, I do some issues that he writes about women in some cases, but that's not the conversation about the voice in women. But I think in terms of ideas about race and thinking about uh, racial solidarity, he would have been against any kind of uh, form of repression, whoever it is happening to, uh, because of the how, ways how, yeah. yeah. how would he, how could he have, um, how would he have uh, reconciled the faith that he had mm. now? Because I mean, Mao yeah. is upholding, he's using this information, yeah. you know, about the civil yeah. rights struggle in the United States and how ironic yeah. that after that, 10 years of yeah. violent suppression. Yeah. You know, oppression but I think, yeah, for a lot of African Americans, they did reconcile. Originally, if you look at, um, Mark Glacio's work on uh, Afro uh, black, uh, black internationalism uh, with Asia from 1895 to about 1945, 1950. We see that it starts with Japan. So some of the same ways they reconcile what Japan was doing. Well, you know, Japan is this model of, you know, uh, kind of this, uh, we can look at them as this model, kind of this leader in this kind of goal, global close solidarity because they beat the uh, Soviet Union, beat Russia in this uh, Russia Japanese war, 1904, 1905. And so holding them up on this kind of uh, pedestal while ignoring kind of Japanese imperialism until it came to the point where they couldn't ignore it any longer. And thinking about, thinking about um, kind of uh, the Japanese invasion of Japan, I think about uh, Nanjing um, specifically, and also thinking about the Japanese invasion and uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor. So in many cases that happened in those moments and thinking about also with Robert Williams and others, they kind of did the same thing. Uh, we're gonna overlook the bad or to see if there's still something here to be good to look for is it because in some cases is it still better than uh, what's happening in the US. I think with this case with the um, what's happening right now, I don't think you can reconcile it to be honest because I think those old patterns of doing something is where well it's better than what's happening in the U.S. not to say that the U.S. is any better but this idea of reconciling it using that framework which you see over and over and over because they were trying to find something that helped them kind of think about moving the situation in the U.S. so it means a little bit betterment for African Americans in any kind of space form or, or support but I think these days you can't necessarily reckon uh, I don't think those old models of reconciling could be done uh, one because there's more information coming out they can't necessarily deny night as easily and say, well, we didn't know, we didn't know the extent of it. Because when Du Bois was traveling, he had handlers. And so I'm not sure why what he saw, he didn't speak the language. I'm not sure what he was told through translators. I think there was a easy for him to use that as a means of reconciliation, but I don't think it's then that you can reconcile uh, those moments. You can't say, you know, we're going to you know, be anti, you know, what's happening at our own borders and then say, but it's okay, what's happening in Xinjiang. You can't do that. I don't think they can reconcile the old ways they were reconciling things back then. So I'm not sure if he could reconcile it. I don't think he probably would have reconciled it, to be honest. I think at a certain point, he would have had to speak out the way he kind of went back and openly apologized to China saying I was wrong in the 30s. He might come back and say, I might have been wrong about this too. I think he would have been open to say, uh, what's happening here is not what I envisioned for the new China. And this is not what you said New China was, and I'm not able to, in some ways, continue to support this. Because not every African American who goes endorses it. Uh, Abby Panky, on my research subject, he goes. He's, a, he's an entertainer, he's a speaker, he's a singer, a uh, contemporary of Paul Robeson. He goes, he's like, Oh, yeah, Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's like, so he's, but then he goes in, and Panky's like, you showed me the same school twice. You showed me the same, like, what is this? Like, you keep showing me the same. Like, he was very crit critical. And so I think, in this moment, and I think there are a lot of people like, like Panky, who's like, 
there's something here I'm not getting and I'm not getting the full picture and I need to ask questions. I think right now, uh, I don't think at the moment where they can try to reconcile the two. I think it'd be a question of um, what is in some ways the best for, we're talking about human rights and civil rights. What are we talking about um, and what does that mean and how do we do this? So I don't think the way they reconciled it back then would actually be able to, to work these days, to be honest. Well, and, and actually yeah. on that, so in, on talking about now, like present day, in terms of Africa, like uh, where um, there's significant uh, Chinese presence, does it give pause to uh, African communities and countries um, to see how China is treating its ethnic minorities, the ones that we just reviewed, talked about, and what could possibly happen if uh, Chinese economic interests collide with um, with national interests or community yeah. interests in East Africa and South Africa, you know, all, all over the continent? Um, I think so. Yeah, because I think they're making. Um, I think in, in some cases, and I think this is a conversation that I've been having more and more. People are like, you know, what is the Chinese policy or their attitudes towards their own ethnic nationalities? What are some of their readings and writings about that? And think about, say, you know, Han chauvinism or think about the Chinese policies towards different groups. How does that in some ways relate to not just domestic policies, but also uh, foreign policy making as well? Are there some parallels between the apparatuses used to make one set of policies and also make, excuse me, another set of policies? And I think there are some overlaps in some of those as well. So I think they are in some ways having more pause. And I think, um, I think the FOCAC of 2018, it gave them, uh, they wrote about human rights. And they, so it was, in writing, it said one thing. But then we saw in 2020, with the kind of backlash as a result of the uh, pandemic, people realized like, well, they said one thing, but then this is what happens when rubber hits the road. So we know that there's in some ways distinction between policy and actions. And I think more countries are starting to take more pause and more stock and say, how we protect our people because many um, African nations did put out statements and saying we want to protect our citizens what's happening so I think there is more of a pause and realizing that these policies while they're on the categories of domestic versus foreign I think they're realizing there is some overlap there and what we do and so I, I recently went to a conference it was in January she was a virtual conference through Black Liberty and one of the, I think the keynote speaker was speaking about the idea of values and what does that mean in terms of, and he's, he's a, works in foreign service. What does that mean for nation states? How do we think about what our values are, what's important? How do we use that to come to negotiation tables? So I think more nations are not necessarily just taking what China is willing to offer, but they're starting to push back a little bit more to say, okay, what is happening here? How does this relate to X, Y, and Z? How did it come down to the specific policies and what does that mean? So I think they are um, using what's happening as a moment of reflection and pause to see um, what, what does it mean for us as well? While we're doing this engagement on the kind of uh, nation state, nation state level, how does this impact, you know, inf uh, inf uh, influence people to people policies or attitudes in those spaces? And how can we find a way to protect our people and our interests? So I think there is a lot of pause. I think there is some heavy mm -hmm. pause reflection. I don't think we've seen um, prior to this. I think prior it was more like, you know, we're taking the resources and whatever that means. But I think now it's more of a, and we can see the shifting in politics, but I think was it recently, was it Ghana or Nigeria where they have just restructured the whole cocoa industry? And they're saying we're not going to. Oh, yeah, what it was. Too. Yeah, they were like, we're not going to keep, you know, sending this to, you know, say Switzerland. Like, we're going to change it. So the, I think that's a shift in terms of how these nations are thinking about uh, their well, role the, globally. And so I think they're taking a pause and they're really thinking like, what mm. does this mean? And so they're making those those shifts. I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank that's you. No, yeah. I mean, I, that's one of the things I'm trying to find a link. Just still, people. I was as like, I think there's a link there. I'm trying to figure out specifically because I'm just throwing on like all this political jargon. <laughs> politics stuff that's not my wheelhouse but i do call what era so i guess i am you know do political stuff you can't get away from me <laughs> that's a great question thank you yeah absolutely these have all been great questions absolutely yeah thank you yeah absolutely anybody else yeah i was about to say anyone else feel free to jump in if not i have a couple more ideas of where to bring the conversation but i want to leave the floor open to uh just then. yeah i have a question Go for it, Daniel. Could you talk a little bit about how or why a common denominator of a non-white racial identity is not always a catalyst or a reason for convergence? Mm. Yeah, um, so I, uh, I think that's a great question. That's why I started um, using critical mixed race scholarship, because what I was finding is that uh, and kind of uh, think about uh, initial mixed race scholarship is very much about white and some other identity. And I was like, but I'm not looking at that in, in this particular moment. And so one of the first anthologies I really got into was uh, Red and Yellow, Black and Brown. And it talks about uh, non-white, non-right. Um, 
racial identities and how that is in some ways a conversation to be had in terms of, of race theory and why it was not necessarily happening. And so for me, that was a kind of really good space to get into these conversations about uh, non-white racial identity. What does that mean? Um, I think there is, um, I think there, it is a catalyst. I think there have been moments historically um, where it has been a catalyst thinking about um, Afro-Asian kind of uh, connections and, and kind of uh, meetings and conversions in the U.S. So there is an anthology by um, Fred, Mullen, Fred Ho and Bill Mullen uh, called Afro-Asia. And they talk in these different essays where they talk about um, in terms of, say, music, in terms of uh, politics, in terms of other moments. Um, or thinking about Robin Kelly and Betsy Esch's piece, uh, Black Like Now, um, and how these kind of conversations are happening where I think there is more of those moments historically that are not always thinking about uh, about them in terms of how those can be uh, moments of, of formation. And we think, for example, the Black Panthers, how you had Japanese Americans who are part of Black Panthers. When thinking about the rise of Black Panthers post-World War II, how the Japanese American experience being uh, put in the internment camps, being rounded up and taken from your homes and being put on these camps where, I mean, just deplorable conditions, uh, most of them in the Northwest, there also was one in Louisiana, which I think that was very interesting. Like there was a, there was a Japanese internment camp in, in Louisiana of all places. Um, but they put them on these internment camps. And what that means for thinking about post-World War II, have the rise of kind of um, the Black Power movement and how that was happening on the West Coast and how you had these identities that are converging and meeting. So I think there are those moments where it happens. I think the, for me, the, the question is, um, why aren't those moments analyzed or highlighted more? Why is in some ways we go back to this idea of comparative racialization where we see that um, in terms of citizenship or belonging, especially in the US space, uh, why does this idea of citizenship been used as kind of this little trinket or dangling from these groups where they're in some ways com compared against each other and in some ways seen as having to compete? Um, and this idea of comparative racialization where um, we take out the idea of uh, and what these different groups are in some ways having to have these kind of moments of thinking about we're in some ways comparison with each other and how this leads to issues in terms of minority communities communities and across the board being able to um, connect. I think for me, I'm, I'm more frustrated where the moments of um, divergence or conflict is more highlighted than the moments of, um, you know, the moments of conflict are more highlighted than the moments of convergence and the moments of collaboration. And there are those moments. I think that's one thing I'm thinking through because um, I think for me personally, in light of what's happened um, in Atlanta, I've been having a lot of colleagues who are um, struggling with not necessarily supporting, but thinking about how do we support a group in some ways who I wouldn't necessarily see them as being supportive of us over the years. I'm like, no, there has been support. We just think about in some ways how it has not been necessarily talked about champion or in some ways celebrated in some of these moments. And so I'm thinking that we need to have more of those moments of thinking about what solidarity and allyship looks like, and how we see this historically, whether it's in the U.S., but also whether it's other places across the globe, too. How there have been historically in those moments, so thinking about Bandung Conference, that was Afro-Asia coming together to think about, you know, moving forward, non army movement, all those kind of moments historically are there as well. So I think it's, it's there. It's just not always some way seen as... Um, it's not always in some ways talked about in ways that could be celebratory. I'm talking about ways in the where it's like divisive. And I think that's where I get more frustrated than anything else. Yeah, great question. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, how it's definitely a source of frustration, how divisions are highlighted rather than um, any collaboration or mutual support being celebrated. Yeah, at home. Thank yeah. You. I mean, think about people like, you know, Yuri Kujama, you know, part of the Black about Grace Lee Boggs, the work that she was doing, even until her, her last breath, she was about, Detroit, and she was building and helping to rebuild post uh, the economic collapse. Like you have those moments, those people who were like they were doing the work, they were there on the ground, and how their stories are not always the ones that we hear about or think about or think about in the sixties and seventies when you had the rise of like you know one in black studies programs. You also had the creation of Asian studies programs and move away from the language of thinking about Oriental to talking about Asian and Asian Americans' identity and how all those are kind of come together where these different identities are helping each other move forward in their own kind of uh, bad paths, but also doing it together where we learn from one group, how they use this infrastructure to do this, how we can use it, how we can support each other. So I think that's one of those moments where we gotta really think about the moments of convergence more than the moments of divergence. Yeah, thank you. I, think, <laughs> I, I was just gonna say, I think that's a really, really um, an important point. And it's something that it's a conversation I think I've seen happen on Tufts campus a little bit actually over the past year or so, um, where just on social media, met many members of the Asian community in light of George Floyd came out and said like, look, this is how like we are gonna support um, the black movement and the same thing is happening now, um, sort of like in, in reaction to what happened in Georgia. And yeah. I just hope that that continues because I think it is important. 
um, in terms of reconciling the divisions that we kind of seem prone to create um, right now. But I'm curious to sort of to end the conversation, how, how do you see, um, how can we ensure that we uplift the positive reinforcing um, stories and narratives rather than sort of the, the negative ones and going forward, what do you think is most important in doing that? Oh, having a difficult conversation. I know that's not always fun, <laughs> but sometimes it's knowing to when to have those difficult conversations. So when you see someone, um, you know, saying something, you know, call them out, hold them accountable. Um, when, uh, if you see something happen, I know the AAPI, the Stop the AAPI, I hate they have a, a, a website where um, if you experience, but also if you witness, I see something, you know, report it and say, this is what I witnessed, this is what happened. Um, put awareness out there so that we can, you know, find those moments where we need to be doing, where can we be supportive. Uh, think about what allyship looks like and means for you. It could be getting involved in an organization. It could be involved in supporting. What does allyship look like for you and what's important and, and important for you? And so I think it's very much thinking about ourselves as allies and support each other. Um, not getting bought down into what I call the struggle Olympics, where, you know, we kind of compare oppression. That's not going to get anybody anything anywhere because the key word is oppression, shared oppressions. And so think about how we can dismantle those systems of oppression. What are you trying to tackle? Uh, what system are you thinking about, you know, trying to, uh, you know, is it looking at uh, racism? Is it sexism? Is it whatever your, your, what it is, but thinking about those and how we can uh, figure out how we can be allies to our, our other people as well. And so, and, you know, having and, and doing it in a way that is um, genuine and important to you, making sure that you do it in a way that is authentic for your experience. And that can be as simple as, you know, organizing something for your classmates. We have, no, let's have a panel about something. It can be that simple, or it can be something more nuanced where you have conversations or whatever's personal to you. And I've seen with, I think you all might have seen it as well, the students from, I think it was it last spring, Yellen Harbor, who wrote letters and talking about what they talk about. They were Chinese American students talking about and thinking through about that doesn't matter, whatever, like, you know, through the immigrant experience. And I think we since some ways think about how to have this conversation with my family to break down some of those understandings intergenerationally. So it's always, you know, it's what you can do, but it's about what's important to you and how you can be, uh, be authentic. Write a piece, write an op ed, write something, kind of share your highlights as out as well, share information. Um, but just be a find a way where you can be an ally and be supportive. I mean, just, you know, what can you do to, to, to help people uh, and to make this uh what a better place and so i hope we uh, continue to do that continue to grow um but I always be comfortable. I trust and believe because everyone in my family, we all have the same racial background. We do not have all the same ideas. And so, so there's some moments where it can be quite tense. <laughs> and when it comes to politics, it can be really quite tense. I'm a Democrat. Some of my relatives are not. And we have those moments. And, you know, it can be difficult, but you have to have those difficult conversations because I'm a firm believer that, you know, growing pains, you need, you know, growing pains is how you grow. And sometimes it's being uncomfortable. That in some ways allows you to get out of your comfort zone, allows you to get out of your own space, kind of and makes you kind of push you out in a way that you never thought you could do. So I'm just, you know, hopefully we can have those moments and we can kind of talk about it. Because we know that race is there, we just never talk about it. It's never a conversation that's bought up. It's not the comfortable conversation, it's not the nice one. And I have learned to sit in that uncomfortableness. Like I go to conference, I'm like, so I have a question about race. And they're like, oh, here she comes. <laughs> but it's learning to where it, I want to bring up the conversation. So and then sometimes we're knowing the moment, knowing to bring it up and just been and having those moments and thinking about allies and being supportive of, of other people and, and their struggle and finding ways to support each other. Yeah. Well, thank you for your comments today. I think just to sort of wrap it up, something that I know a conversation has been happening against among some EPIC students is the way, and to tie it back to Sino-Black relations, the way that often in the whole um, study of international relations, race is overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something over the past couple of weeks, we had a guest lecturer in Epic come in and sort of talk about that um, and something that students in Epic have been thinking about a lot in the past couple of weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And so thank you for coming today and giving us your remarks. If anyone else has anything else they wanna say at the end, um, that is, feel free to do so now, but I wanna thank Dr. Brown for joining us. Thank this you. was a wonderful conversation. <laughs> um, so thank you for being here. And oh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the questions. I greatly enjoyed this conversation. So thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so you. much. So nice to meet you all. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Bye.